everyone. I really hope everybody can hear me all right. It's always a little point of worry when hosting these virtual events. Uh, I got confirmation from my team that it seems to work all right. Um, well, welcome everybody to our event today on interoperability on the DS uh, in the DMA and DSA. Uh, since it's only one hour, I want to make sure that uh, we get as much um, information from the speakers as possible. But uh, on behalf of Open Forum Europe, I want to welcome you all to this session. So uh, without further ado, I'll welcome the moderator, Samuel Stalton, uh, on stage. And it seems to work. Thank you very much, Esther. Thanks so much for your welcome there. And good afternoon and welcome to all of our attendees tuning in from all over the world today for this virtual event entitled Interoperability in the Digital Markets Act and the Digital Services Act, brought to you, as Astor said there, by the Open Forum Europe, an independent think tank which supports openness in computing and in the digital world. My name is Samuel Stolter and I'm the digital editor at Euractiv and I'll be moderating today's session. So how can the European Commission's Digital Markets Act and Digital Services Act proposals now being debated, of course, by the Parliament and Council, do more to stimulate competition and to get a better deal for users of digital services like social media, instant messaging and search? How can the package make it easier for European tech startups to compete fairly in these markets, give European consumers a better choice of services and better protect fundamental rights such as privacy? Well, these are some of the questions that we will seek to probe today as part of our panel discussion on the topic of interoperability across the two files. For this cause, we are very pleased indeed to be joined by an expert panel this afternoon. We have with us here today Isa Stasi, Senior Legal Officer at Rights Group Article 19. We're also joined by Ian Brown, Independent Researcher. We've also got Amandine Le Pape, co-founder of the Messaging Technology Element and also co-founder of the Matrix.org Foundation, an open source initiative. And we're very pleased to be joined by Agustin Rayner, Director for Legal and Economic Affairs at the European Consumer Organization, BOEC. As always, you can get involved with today's conversation by posing your own questions to the panel using the chat functionality on the platform, and we shall pick them up as they come through throughout the session. And just to remind you that this event is being recorded. So we've got an hour to go. So without further ado, I think it's just about time to jump straight in to our discussion today. And I think it's it would be remiss of us perhaps not to start at the very beginning of the debate around interoperability in the DMA. And perhaps I could turn to Ian Brown for the first question on this one. And we're really focusing here on Article 6, 1F of the DMA, which stipulates that gatekeepers should only provide interoperability to business users for ancillary services and not core services. And of course, before the official presentation of the text on uh, December the 15th, there were rumours that this provision would be broader and earlier drafts actually uh, seem to signify that as well. So why the change in approach from the Commission here from core to ancillary services and what exactly happened in terms of the Commission's change in approach within that period of time? Ian. Uh I think this is a really key point. Um, I think the proposal that we have from the Commission um, and the, the Article 61F that you mentioned is a good starting point. Um, we all know that, uh, as Mark Andreessen said a decade ago, software is eating the world. All, all kinds of industry sectors are being digitized. And I think 61F does a good job as it is in making sure that the, the big gatekeepers of today don't just take over all these other industry sectors as well. So Europe is very strong in um, automobiles, for example, and um, I think without this kind of regulatory provision, you could well imagine today's big gatekeepers in tech um, taking, you know, being the big automobile manufacturers of, of the next decade. But I think it is a key omission, as you said, that this uh, this form of, of text in the, the final proposal doesn't cover 
um, social media services, instant messaging, in particular, the core services themselves. The draft that was leaked in September went much further. I was just reminding myself exactly what it said. And it has a provision that's quite like the final text, but it has three other provisions that go further as well that would cover the core services. I don't know why that happened. I can only imagine there was a lot of lobbying going on between September and December. Right, so we've got those three elements of the blacklist, whitelist, greylist, whichever one that it was that seemed to just disappear from the final text there. That's right. And the, the, those colour lists turned into uh, Article 5, the self-executing -ex responsibilities in Article 6, the responsibilities that can be further specified by the Commission. I think um, interoperability would always be in the second because there are some important small details that I think you couldn't put on the face of the Act. Um, but yes, we've got this quite narrow provision now that only covers ancillary services and only covers business users. And I think, and many other people think, it should also cover core services, especially social media and interoperability. And it should be a right for end users as well as business users. Okay, thanks Ian. So we've got this business users and ancillary situation here now, Isa Stasia, Article 19. Um, there has been the argument, at least from what I've heard in Brussels, that a broader approach for interoperability could actually hamper and harm innovation. Uh, what's your response to this? Well, um, there have been also uh, um, discussions and rumours about exactly the opposite. Uh, so I, I tend to believe that this is uh, um, a very, very uh, nice debate that is going on. And it's not, uh, it has not been brought by the DMA. It was actually there years ago already. Um, our approach is to take it from the user perspective, so from the, the end user perspective. From the end user perspective, interoperability is definitely a key tool, a key tool that I mean that delivers a lot of outcome, positive outcomes for end users. And of course, it, it also creates some challenges, uh, but the majority of, of um, remedies, they do as well. So it's a matter of how do you shape it, uh, and uh, by that I mean also taking into account of the principles of uh, the principle of proportionality while shaping the the interoperability remedy. Um, the good part of it is that we we're not we don't need to start from scratch. Interoperability is already present in the European Union regulatory frameworks. Um, it is in the European Electronic Communication Code. It has been uh, singled out by competition authorities in the past as well. So it's not nothing uh, absolutely new we cannot play with and we are scared about. So those challenges, I, I believe they're absolutely, um, it's absolutely possible to overtake them or to shape interoperability uh, in the specific use cases in a way that it, it doesn't uh, create troubles. Now, why it's, it, it, it does, why the idea that it's a tool for end users and it's a tool to foster innovation are complementary? Why those are extremely linked? Um, because uh, for end users, interoperability means real choice, means possibility to uh, take back some control and decide, uh, you know, have, have, have uh, easier possibility for switching, have also uh, different uh, uh, real alternatives uh, to um, look at. Uh, now, if end users in principle are in principle free to do so, they of course create a lot of space for demand for new products, alternative products, innovative products. So from uh, startups or from uh, alternative players, uh, there is a space uh, they can enter to and fill with innovative products. So it, it, that's why I think we're talking about the two sides of the same coin in a way. Um, so yes, uh, but as I, as I mentioned, and as I said, we're strongly convinced that interoperability is a tool to an end. So we need, you know, those ends could be user empowerment and innovation. I'm strongly convinced they go hand to end. That's why um, I think that uh, both the DMA and the DSA should pay particular attention to that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Maybe, me, me, yeah. sorry. Perhaps we can get onto the DSA in a bit more detail later on, but just honing in now on this point about innovation. Of course, the pro-interoperability crowd say that actually innovation would be increased with um, a more bolstered interoperability provision within the text. But those perhaps against that idea say that interoperability is bad for innovation. So perhaps you could frame this debate here 
around innovation and maybe cut through some of the confusion and, and clarify for us whether actually it would be good or bad for innovation or if it's not so black and white at the moment? I think it's, a, um, as a matter of fact, uh, it is, um, uh, it is not black and white, as you said, it's a spectrum of possibilities. It's also a spectrum of different uh, um, interoperability provisions that we can advocate for, that we might think uh, are going to fit for purpose. I mentioned at the beginning uh, uh, the issue uh, with proportionality, and I'm strongly convinced that it really depends on the specific use cases. Uh, now, um, the, the main point is that um, the DMA uh, is supposed to uh, create uh, contestability in the market, to be used for that, and fairness, right? Um, now, contestability in the, in the market in the medium and long term, at least, is, is up, it's very much not possible without innovation. Um, so if you trigger one, you're basically stimulating the other as well, or at least this is what traditionally we have thought, and that's why we have always relied on competition as we have innovative markets as well. Um, so once again, we are talking about factors that strongly interplay to each other. And uh, uh, the idea that um, I've, I've heard a lot of uh, people discussing, coming with the idea that um, in this in the scenario we have now with gatekeepers, gatekeepers are big platform. They bring network effects and they bring also some efficiencies related to issues such as scale. Now, for end users, scale might get some advantage, might bring some advantages as well, to, and for business users um, too. So um, the point is, um, the, from that perspective, uh, they used to be um, uh, um, the the arguments used to be, if we um, uh, try to stimulate competition among platforms, where we're going to end up. We're going to lose also some efficiencies, we're going to lose some positive effects of, of scale and concentration, etc. Um, I think, um, to get back to your initial point, this is to, uh, uh, this is this argument is presented as a dichotomy and I don't think it is. I think we need to work on the nuances, I think we need to be a little bit more ambitious, I think we need more debate about, you know, um, how many platforms uh, we need, what's the maximum number of platforms that we need in order not to kill innovation or in order not to, to lose the, the um, advantages of uh, concentration in a way. Um, all this seems to be absent and of course, a stake there is uh, the uh, innovation we're going to see in the next uh, years to come. Uh, so that's, what, that's why I think the baseline for this discussion should be, uh, as I said, it should be a little bit more diverse and complex, taking into account the different nuances more than just uh, providing a yes or no answer. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Isa, there. Um, Agustin Reiner now from Buick. Um, by extension, therefore, if we're talking about interoperability, um, being able to foster innovation and to the benefit of end users, how could this make Europe's digital digital economy more competitive generally? In what ways could more a more of a robust interoperability provision help make these markets more competitive? And on the other, other side of the coin, if core services go untouched, then to how much of an extent will market dominance become more entrenched than it currently is? Thank you, Samuel. Um, thank you also to um, OFE for organizing this, uh, this discussion. I think it's very good that we are we're able to discuss now that the DMA um, have been already uh, published. There are there are several actually uh, questions in, in in your question somewhere. Perhaps to take a step step back, um, we should indeed start by giving some merit to the Commission for the mere fact of having this this proposal. I think that the proposal in itself. Um, is um, uh, having the proposal is is, is, an, is an achievement in, in in itself. Do not forget that the commission has the the um, the right to initiate legislation. So I think that um, to a certain extent, you know, we, we need to acknowledge that as well. Um, however, when when it comes to interoperability, has been as I said already um, quite timid, and um, we cannot forget that we are talking about a regulation that applies to certain players. Particular, you know, the gatekeepers uh, once they they have been uh, identified according to to the thresholds that are that are set in the in the regulation. So this is um, not for every single company, um, 
and we are talking about in the particular case of um, interoperability regarding core services that have been already well identified as presenting market failures um, for um, for users. The, the the simple fact that you know, I think everybody has experience that you cannot text um, to a competing um, a communication app and represent a, 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 a market failure that has also effects on 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 how this uh, this markets um, developed um, and in that regard we have seen and, and, and witnesses over the over the years an uh, increasing degree of concentration in these markets uh, due to the lack of, of measures as well that stimulate uh, competition being one of them uh, interoperability so to answer to your first part of your question I think this indeed can um, uh, reposition Europe kind of in a <laughs> global competitive landscape in the sense of um, not only being a, a, a regulatory uh, power but also um, being able actually to set the condition for startups in Europe and also Europe anybody that wants to make business here to be able to um, enjoy the benefits and 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 is these rules get get through as we we expect them to to do including um uh, interoperability for core services such as um communication app and, and social media that that these companies also see an opportunity here to do business and to reach out to to, to customers beyond their their, their their niche markets in where they're currently operating okay and i mean in terms of you know giving the commission their their dues for presenting this but as Ian highlighted earlier on, I mean, we saw earlier drafts that uh, suggested that the Commission had a lot more confidence than they ended up with at the end. So in the very uh, before the December the 15th presentation to make the Commission take such a big step back. Wait, I'm the only one that lose, lost someone. Do you hear me? Yeah, now I can hear you. You hear me? Okay. So yes, I just yes. wanted to go, go back to Ian's um, earlier yes. point about the blacklist drafts that were released by the Commission. Of course, we give the Commission their dues for coming out with the DMA on December the 15th as, as usual. But there was such a big step back in terms of the interoperability provisions in the final text. So, I mean, in your opinion, what exactly went on there and how can the Commission justify not applying interoperability more broadly here well i, I can really comment on what's going on in the kitchen of uh, of the commission they should mm. know better and um, the reality is the proposal it is what it is and we have to um work on uh, on this basis um i think personally i think that when it comes to um the core services that we are discussing so communication apps and or communication services and social media i think that it has been established the need to have interoperability in these markets in order to increase increase the contestability of these markets allow new entrants provide more choice to consumers innovation everything that was have been uh, been uh, been said before um no idea the commission has been subject to um to lobbying to kind of reduce the the, the scope which is something that they can they can answer and they're in a better place to answer that but i do think that um if we see for example position of the european parliament in a um, digital um, markets uh, digital services act at the time re um, resolution which also covers the the, the dma as, as well as um, several conclusions of the council i think that the decision maker the the, the co decision makers will be eventually supportive of this idea of course we are going to see a lot of lobbying um coming from from those that are primarily concerned about these new rules loving that they will deploy not only by themselves but also through the multiple trade organization paid academics you know think tanks so on and so forth so we're going to see the decision making being bombarded and of course trying to build a case for uh, against in, in uh, interoperability because this will go into damage uh, privacy security this is going to be end up 
being uh, bad for consumers. What I can tell you is that um, based on the experience that we have had in the past in other markets regarding uh, mandating interoperability without going any further um, uh, payment services, the, the experience is quite positive. And I think that we should build on past experiences and, and, and knowing that here what we're trying to do is to open the market for new entrants, for to have more innovation, more choice. And we cannot forget that these rules are applying to those companies that have the technical capability, that have the resources, that are well placed to deploy the necessary protocols in order to enable interoperability. So this is not about creating costs that are going to be passed on, on to consumers. Those smaller companies, and Amadine can, can speak um, uh, better about that, you know, they have the choice if they want to interoperate with the, with the gatekeepers. But the starting point is to make those key gatekeepers interoperate, to create the obligation so others are able, uh, if, they, if they wish to do so, um, uh, to, to interoperate with their, the gatekeepers' core, um, uh, core services. Uh, so I think we should not re we should not forget or lose sight of what really what we are regulating and who are we regulating here. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Augustine. Um, and I think now's a good time to bring in Amandine as a representative from Europe's SME ecosystem here. And Amandine, your instant messaging company Element employs the Matrix protocol and offers communications across services including Slack, Telegram, Jitsi, Meet, etc. For you, in what practical ways would stronger interoperability provisions in the DMA help the development of your own services in the future? Perhaps you could give us a few practical examples. Sure, thank you. Um, so yeah, I think the, I, am, I have two hats here. Uh, one is the fact I'm one of the co-founder of the Matrix uh, protocol. So we created Matrix to precisely solve that. It's like we're, it is crazy. We cannot talk between applications. Um, why can we send SMS from one provider to another? How, why can we send email from one provider to another? How can I can access my email from my iPhone email phone as well um, app as well as a browser? But um, not for chat. So we created Matrix precisely to solve this. So when we saw that the regulation was actually going into that direction, we thought like, okay, that's good. The world is converging. People have understood that we need this. We need this to open the market. We cannot keep our communication stuck into big, uh, big silos uh, and completely fragmented. So that's one, one side of it. Then on the other side, yes, we have um, Element as the startup who is indeed building on top of Matrix. But if we were not building on top of this open protocol for, um, for real-time communication, then yes, we would be stuck. You would have to, as a small company who is trying to provide uh, a very specific value with uh, some uh, social media or instant messaging targeting maybe a specific use case, then you have to build your user base from scratch, which is almost close to impossible, basically. So um, having, the, um, having the EU going into the right direction and trying to uh, mandate this interoperability definitely helps small companies um, building, bringing their own value because no, not everyone is after the same things. My grandmother doesn't need the same app to talk to me than I need to talk to my colleagues as well. Or some, um, I don't know, some filmmakers maybe need a very specific chat app into their filmmaking applications so that they can communicate with the rest of the ecosystem or estate, estate agents. Like there are so many use cases for social media, for instant messaging, for voice and video. Why are we every time forced to install one given app? So we really saw it as a, as a light of hope in terms of acceleration. Uh, if they're not pushing the core services, then it just means we'll have to work harder. We have to make sure we get and get in touch with all these big uh, giants that we're already talking to. But it's, it's a lot of more legwork uh, to make them understand that at some point uh, they will have to open up. We're basically the way we're doing it on our side is copying what happens with email. Initially, email had multiple protocols. Someday, um, uh, people got together, decided that SMTP was a good uh, baseline, and everyone converged to a set towards SMTP, except from Microsoft, uh, who refused to get exchange on SMTP. 
until one day, well, everyone else were into this big open bubble of SMTP and they were stuck into their big, their small silo of um, X, X400. And they had no choice. And that's basically what we're trying to do. And if, if we don't get help from the EU, it's going to take more time. It's going to be harder to eventually bring uh, this interoperability to everyone. But hopefully one day we have the long tail of everyone jumping on the board of the big open network. And then the big silos will realize that they're missing on the value here. And they could be, they could be part of this big ecosystem too. Mm. And you can imagine in that scenario, for example, it would make our marketplaces, at least in the digital economy, so much more competitive, no, competitive because, you know, these businesses are really striving to improve their services for the same user base, because we all have access to those different users in a fully interoperable world. Um, so, yeah, hopefully that would be the, the end result there. Um, just a reminder to all our attendees, please submit your questions through to us on the chat. I can see a few coming in at the moment. And uh, I'd like to pick up on one here. Um, and uh, this is from someone called SV. And I'm so glad this question has come up, actually, because this is something that has been dogging my mind for a few months. Uh, I know Ian Brown's responded to it um, but perhaps we can uh, bring in Ian as well on this point um, after Isa and Agustin have, have commented on it. And SV asks, can someone give some examples on the distinction between ancillary and core services? I think here we're talking about definitions, really, and the challenge of defining what actually is an ancillary service in respect to a core service, because I imagine there's some ancillary services that rely fundamentally on the operation of core services and vice versa. Um, so perhaps, Isa, I could turn to you on this one first um, to address SV's question. Yes, thanks for this opportunity. Um, before I answer, I, uh, I would like to also add a layer in this question to see whether you know, the feeling of also the other panelists and the people following us is the same. Uh, the, uh, DMA uh, does contain a number of useful um, uh, definitions, of course. One is the core platform services, and it, it is, you know, they have they've been identified based on a number of, of factors, which I tend to agree with. But then they also contain the definition of business users services and ancillary services. And this is what I'm struggling to uh, um, kind of uh, really identify not only the differences between the two, which might be more nuanced than the difference between the core platform services and the ancillary services, but also why we really need this. So we do need this because it's mentioned in uh, the Article 6.1.F, which, you know, as we know uh, already, is uh, one of the target of our uh, attention. Uh, and it's also mentioned in a couple of other lines in, in, the, in Article 5 and, and 6. Uh, but I still, you know, still wonder why we needed this subcategory, let's say, because I do attribute ancillary services, uh, the value of a subcategory of business user services. Having said that, uh, I think uh, an easy example is uh, to consider uh, payment services as ancillary to the service you're paying for, uh, or identification services as ancillary to the services you're, you need access to, uh, you need identification to, to, uh, to have access to. Um, so in a way, they, um, they complement the main service, uh, but they're not uh, uh, necessary. Uh, we thinking that you might have possibilities to uh, uh, get uh, the main service without uh, necessarily going through those ancillary services. Now, it's a concept that has been. It comes, I guess, it comes from the competition legacy. Um, it has it has been used in a number of competition soft law instruments, guidelines by the Commission, etc., to um, identify uh, provisions in certain kind of contact, con contract contracts that had a little bit less. Um, um, that created a little bit less worry uh, with regards to the main, the core service, um, because of the structural, uh, structural, uh, um, um, the, the way that the, the structural value they had for um, for the users. Um, at the moment, uh, this definition it it, it simply uh, seems to give us the message uh, that uh, the the commission. Uh, is looking way more at inter-platform competition than, sorry, intra-platform competition than inter-platform competition. So this, I think the 
the use of uh, the ancillary services uh, as a definition, as a concept, it kind of tend, yeah, it brings us in that direction. It gives that message, which mm -hmm. as we said, is a disputable message. Okay, thanks, Isa. I'd like to bring in Agustin Rayner on this point and then perhaps go back to Ian Brown for the question that's just come in on security and privacy, bearing in mind Ian's background. So, Agustin, just following on from Isa's point there about um, the difference between uh, ancillary services and core services, what sort of a position do you adopt in this debate? And would you support more of a prescriptive approach in terms of identifying beforehand the services that would come under that scope? Or, or where do you stand on this issue? Um, I think for the purpose of the um, enforceability of this uh, regulation, we need to define the services in the um, in the specific provisions of the uh, of the regulation. Um, nothing prevents, of course, that the Commission, uh, through the mechanism foreseen Article 10, could eventually extend it to other other services. But I think that the services need to be mentioned. Um, now, regarding the distinction between core and ancillary services, for the purpose of interoperability, I don't really think that it make this distinction make sense. You know, you can just simply add a list of services that are subject to, um, uh, inter uh, to interoperability, and you will save a lot of time and, and headaches in trying to classify one or the other. I think that this distinction came from the fact that the Commission didn't want to take a um, too intrusive approach in the business models of these companies and therefore restricted only to ancillary services. Um, but uh, I don't think that we, we really need this, this definition if we list the services that we are that they are, we are talking about. And I think when it comes to um, services like uh, interpersonal communication services using the <laughs> uh, Brussels jargon or communication apps, to keep it simple, um, as well as social media networks, I think it's very clear that here we have a market failure that could be addressed by means of this uh this rule so i don't see why it should be too complicated just simply to name the the services so maybe just include a couple of definition of why we understand for one and the other uh, but i think that will be much more straightforward and mm -hmm. okay and on that point agustin does that make it perhaps less future proof i mean of course we have this provision in article 10 that allows us to make certain revisions when necessary. But if we adopt a prescriptive approach of actually mentioning the services themselves in the text, does this lessen the ability of the DMA to, to have the ability to step in uh, when new services appear in the future? No, I, I don't think so. Um, different reasons, three reasons. First reason is, of course, through Article 10, uh, depending on its final shape, the, the Commission would be able through the um, Comitology and Implemented Act to extend it, for example, to other, other services. But remains to be seen how this article is going to look like the end. Secondly, this could also be addressed by a more narrower um, re review clause in which, for example, after a couple of years, two years or one year, the Commission needs to make a report about whether other services should be included, so on and so forth. And the third reason, and this is something that has popped, for example, in the uh, in the debate around the adoption of the GDPR. And a technique was, um, particularly from uh, from the industry that was being regulated, to say, you need something future-proof, so let's keep it at principle level. But then try to enforce a principle. Almost impossible. Almost impossible. If you don't have a norm actually making that principle operational that you can enforce, now, then you're going to just discuss uh, before courts about how to how to deal with it. So I, I, I'm, I'm, for this type of regulation and concerning the companies that we are regulating here, uh, an approach in which we should list the, the services is much more straightforward uh, than having a principle-based mechanism, um, even under the pretext of not being uh, future-proof. But the reality is that if we need then to enforce a principle, we're going probably to spend much more time uh, dealing with this rather than just revising the, the specific provisions of the regulation or through Article 10 of the uh, of the possibility for the Commission to, to include new services in, in the scope. Okay, thanks, Agustin. Um, I'd like now to turn to perhaps a different subject that we haven't covered so far um, in terms of those arguing against greater interoperability provisions in the DMA text. And that is from the perspective of security and privacy, uh, which is another one of these arguments that has been floating around, uh, at least here, the Brussels bubble for some time. 
And we have a question here from Claudia Pretner, who is a legal policy advisor at Amnesty Tech. And Claudia asks, there are some voices that claim that interoperability could make communication less secure and could lead to further security breaches. What do you think of such claims? And the man to answer this question is, of course, Ian Brown. Um, you do hear this claim often, and I think it's very poorly founded. For Actually, Agustin half answered this question already. Um, uh, Facebook, as we know, is... is um, has already made its main messenger service and Instagram messenger interoperable. The, the nine largest UK banks have made their services interoperable. Um, the telecoms industry across Europe have made their services interoperable for the last 25 years, thanks to the European Electronic Communication Code and its predecessors. So from a technical perspective, and I'm a computer scientist specializing in computer security, um, it is absolutely feasible to um, ask these big, very sophisticated gatekeep gatekeeper platforms, because that's, who we're talking about regulating. We're not talking about regulating the, the three-person SME or the two-person open source software team. It will be entirely up to those organizations separately if they want to take advantage of interoperability mandates on you know, the 12 to 20, at most perhaps, very large gatekeeper companies that, um, that we are talking about. So um, I think it's always good to keep security in mind and often it's not kept in mind, um, but I think in this, uh, you know, the very particular kinds of regulation we're talking about, I really don't see it as an issue. Right, and just, just, just to, yeah, Amandine, I'll come back to you in a second, but Ian there, these big tech platforms, they have the technical capacities at the current time to introduce interoperability, but it's, they're making almost a political decision not to. I, 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 even more straightforwardly, an economic decision, yes. Mm, mm. Okay, thanks, Ian. Amandine, you wanted to jump in there. Yeah, I just wanted to jump on the fact that, in fact, interoperability can even give you more power to choose the most private platform because you have the choice of who you trust with your data, basically. So it's, um, it's very much taking it one step further, especially if we man mandate end-to-end -end encryption, for example, for all these sorts of, um, of services. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And perhaps, Omondine, we could stay with you for another question that's come through here uh, from Astor, actually. And uh, Astor asks, it was mentioned that interoperability has been used to increase competition in the past. Could the panelists perhaps give some examples of this? Sure. So I think, um, so basically interoperability means you are building in an open ecosystem. And you can see what open ecosystems do. Look at the web and the, the size of the market. Actually, um, it's, um, I, I even had the number, which I forgot, but like the, the market size of the world, the web is like hundreds of trillions of dollars. If you look at the market size of um, instant messaging, it's hundreds of billions. It's nothing. And that's what uh, the lack of inter interoperability is triggering. It's completely hindering the, the market. And then you can look at the, um, as Ian was mentioned, as an example, the um, uh, telecom operators. It's been in the last 20 years, uh, you've started to see the big, um, like in France, for example, Orange was like the default of France Telecom was the um, state run uh, op uh, operator. And then they started opening up more and more and um, and you could you start to see competition and price going down because you have to be the best you have to provide the best value you have to provide the best uh, prices and to be the most relevant by creating competition you uh, create innovation mm -hmm. okay thanks very much Amandine. um i'm conscious of the fact we're rapidly running out of time actually and we haven't spoken much about the dsa so um Perhaps, Isa, I could turn to you for this one. Um, in terms of the Digital Services Act itself, how much do you believe that the text could be improved to bolster these interoperability provisions? And what's your reading of the extent to which the DSA, as it stands, fosters interoperability? And would you suggest any particular changes to the text? Thank you. Uh, very um, complex question. Uh, but it gives me the possibility to bring uh, what I think uh, could be a lens to which to look at the two uh, pieces of legislation. So the DSA focuses on how certain services should be provided, right? So DMA, it's focusing on market dynamics and how we want our market to be shaped in the future. Uh, and um, I don't think it will be possible 
or any ambitious plan that takes into account different stakeholders' rights and obligations, and it takes into account the benefit that could be created um, to keep those two conversations to separate it. Um, it. It is simply not possible for the way the markets are shaped now and those services are provided to look at uh, how the service needs to be provided without regulating the market where the players that provide those services are. Um, so I, I'm strongly convinced that the more the interplays between these two tools are considered, uh, the better the final texts will be. Uh, so interoperability as a tool, I tend to see this more uh, uh, an instrument dealing with the way we want to see the markets in the future. So ideally, I think there will be more space for the DMA to push for, for this. Having said that, we have already uh, identified and, and spoken about specific, the possibility to modulate interoperability depending on specific use cases. So now, if in a DSA that looks at specific services, we identify use cases where we think interoperability could add value, or it could be a, a good instrument, uh, then most probably we can think about having specific interoperability provisions in the DSA as well. An example I can come up with is Article 29 of this DSA that talks about well, that, that rules uh, uh, recommend the system. Now, recommend the systems are, um, are very, very often, especially on social media platforms, they are offered as a bundle together with a hosting service. Uh, but um, they're actually two different services. So Article 29, uh, that addresses only the very large online platforms, by the way, so uh, we're not talking about gatekeepers, but yet we're talking about asymmetric regulations, so only certain, certain players that are uh, bigger than others, of course. Um, so it, it kind of that that article uh, those two things. The first one adds it sets some transparency on how the recommender systems uh, provide their service, so that users end users in this case they will know more about this. It also kind of obliges those platforms to provide an option uh, to provide the service without profiling the users, um, and it also kind of says that uh, the platforms are obliged to provide a, a, an interface where people, users and users, they can select this option, the non-profiled options or other options as they please. And this should be easy. It should be easy for, for the end users to choose. Uh, now, the way I see interoperability kicking in is um, if, we, if we think about opening the market for recommended systems and with if we think about the possibility for, for an end users of a platform that provides hosting and recommendation and recommend a system to, to look outside the platform and pick a third party provider for the, recommenders, the recommendation system, um, then what we would need there is essentially interoperability. We would need a very large online platform to provide to third party players the possibility to interoperate with the platform and provide the service to the end users. So there, I see very well the possibility to add a line in the article that would explicitly provide for interoperability on that specific use case. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, um, thanks for that, Isa, for your um, suggestion there. I'd like to stay on the topic of data use, actually, because we've got quite an interesting question that's come in here from Carl Sykes. Um, and Carl asks... I was wondering where the existing right to data portability in the GDPR sits within the new proposals for interoperability. How does interoperability encompass data portability? How does or could it go further? Um, and perhaps, Ian, you're nodding your head there. Would you like to address this one? Absolutely. And I, um, the GDPR Article 20 gives gives uh, Europeans the right to take their data from one service and move it to another service. And this certainly um, would help if it was enforced. It's not. Um, but if it was more strongly enforced today, um, if I wanted to move from, let me just take one potential gatekeeper example, Facebook, to a competitor social media service, um, I would have the right to do that. And actually, Facebook and Google and some of the other big platforms provide very good tools. I mean, they're legally required to. We shouldn't be too um, grateful. But uh, you are able to download your data from those platforms relatively easily. The problem, the, the problem from a competition perspective and why interoperability is so is so important is okay I've moved my social media profile from Facebook to a competitor or from WhatsApp to Element or to Signal but now I can't talk to my friends anymore that's the whole point of a social a social media service and an instant messaging platform so this is what interoperability does 
many people have argued for a stronger portability right um, instead of or alongside a portability right. Um, uh, and actually, the DMA proposal does include real time portability requirements. So that's that's good. That takes portability forward, but it still doesn't solve the problem I just mentioned. So now I could have my Facebook account. I could also have another social media service account or I could have WhatsApp and another messaging account. I could use this real time portability uh, power to take my data all the time from those accounts, you know, to have it connected if it was implemented properly. I would, from a, but this is really critical in terms of competition driving quality and protecting values like privacy. I would need to maintain my accounts on those original services. So competition economists love talking about multi-homing and say that multi-homing can solve all these problems. What are you talking about? You know, everyone should just have a, have a WhatsApp and element and signal and blah um, uh, account and everyone will be happy. The problem with that is I don't want to have to accept Facebook's terms and conditions to profile me wherever I go around the web and whatever I share with my friends um, in order to stay in touch with my family and friends. Um, that's why I actually closed my own personal Facebook account five or six years ago. Unfortunately, I still find I have to maintain a WhatsApp account because a lot of my friends and family are there, including in groups, and I just can't communicate them uh, with them because of the lack of interoperability uh, if, uh, without that account. So I think this is you know, very abstractly, I think you can look at interoperability and portability as almost mirror images of each other, but speaking you know, much more um, uh, particularly about what's in the GDPR, what's in the proposed DMA, that's how I would draw the, the distinction. Mm -hmm. And Agustin, you were nodding your head there as well. I wonder if I could bring you in on this discussion uh, when we're talking about the data portability provisions in the GDPR and the interoperability in the, uh, with regards to the DMA and the DSA. Um, and there's also another question coming through from Faya uh, van den Boom, who asks, the GDPR right does not allow intermediaries to do it for you or provide companies with this right. Does the DMA or the DSA overrule the GDPR in this sense, and perhaps how can these two work in tandem, portability and interoperability with one another? Thank you, Austin. Um, it's a really interesting discussion. Um, to start from the beginning, um, portability, it's, it's a very good right, totally underused, <laughs> under-enforced, uh, and it has its limitations in the GDPR. So I think that um, there are also plans um, from the Commission to do something in this regard in their um, upcoming um, Data Act. Uh, I think a lot can be done, but you're not going to solve the lack of interoperability with portability. Many of the services in which we have or we need interoperability does not imply, do not require data portability. Think about open banking. For open banking, there is no portability of data per se. No, you have access to the uh, appropriate um, application programming interfaces. Um, so in this regard, I think I like what, what Ian, Ian says, there are two important elements, no, but one does not exclude the other, not at all. On the contrary, having, interoper having portability should not be seen as an excuse to not have interoperability because they tackle completely different problems, which are related. Sometimes portability might imply also for, uh, sorry, interoperability might imply also portability. So if you will have interoperability between you know, um, uh, social media uh, uh, services in which you can pass you know, your uh, your content that, that is being hosted to, from one to the other, okay, that might imply also a portability uh, element. Um, and then regarding how this interplays with the GDPR, I think it's an extremely interesting discussion. We cannot forget that both the DMA and the GDPR have different objectives. Objective of GDPR is to protect um, and implement the fundamental right to personal data. The objective of the of the DMA is increase market contestability, um, and of course, both need to work uh, together. And what is very interesting is that, of course, the DMA makes several references to the to the GDPR, and making sure that you know where um, choices are being made, that the GDPR is, is respected. But when we think uh, when we look at the um, portability right. Uh, it's extremely interesting the mentioning of the um, the provision of continuous and real time access, which this is a, one of the limitations perhaps that the portability rights of GDPR has. So something to look more closely, and I don't have the answer yet, but I think it's worth studying, 
is really what the, the, the DMA adds to what we have in the GDPR and adds it only in relation to the gatekeepers. Um, so I think there's something to, to keep in mind also when we discuss eventually in the future the Data Act, which might um, uh, improve to a certain extent, hopefully the, um, the limitations of the um, portability right of the, um, uh, of the GDPR, but not only for gatekeepers, but in relation to any, any player actually uh, processing personal data. Mm -hmm. And then I feel actually a, a broader discussion about enforcement as well, because the GDPR has set quite a, a, a worrying precedent in this field. And if it's anything like that in the DMA, then um, enforcement will, will be a challenge indeed. Um, but perhaps that's a, a discussion uh, for another time. We are rapidly running out of time, actually, um, looking at the clock now. Um, thank you for all your questions that are coming in thick and fast. Um, perhaps we can get back to a couple of those in writing. But I would like now to turn back to our panelists for their short closing statements, perhaps summarizing their main points that they've tried to highlight throughout this afternoon's panel. And to start with this, perhaps we could go to Amandine Lepap from Element. Thank you. Um, in summary, yeah, it's it's a great move that uh, the Europe started. It's a bit sad that it's um, been shorter. Uh, there have been some step backs on what was uh, originally the plan. Uh, we, from from an industry perspective, uh, we really believe that that's the future. That's how we are going to manage to give the power back to the users in terms of who is hosting their data and the app they use to actually use their data. Uh, on our side, we are definitely working towards interoperability and promoting it as much as we can alongside a lot of other industry players out there. And, um, and yes, we really hope that the um, end user also gets educated on the need for that. Uh, it's not necessarily a concept which is easy to grasp when uh, you don't understand how an app works, that you need a server, that you need a client, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but um, yeah, we'll do uh, um, everything which is possible in our power to actually make this move forward and uh, really looking forward to see the progress the EU could make into that direction. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Amandine, for joining us here this afternoon. Ian Brown, Independent Researcher, I'd like to hear your closing statement, please. Very briefly, I am excited that this is all happening. I've been writing and researching this topic for over a decade. I think it could make for a much better internet. I think it could address, not solve on its own, but be an important part of the solution of a number of the problems that we see um, online. So it's great we are taking steps. Um, uh, I hope that now the Commission has published its proposal that members of the European Parliament, some of whom have already made some really positive sta statements um, about taking interoperability just that little bit further, because I don't think we should give up on competition on social media and instant messaging or these other gatekeeper platforms. Um, so I'm keeping my fingers crossed. OK, thanks very much, Ian. And we'll, of course, have to see what the developments in the European Parliament uh, end up like uh, bearing in mind there's quite a bit of a battle at the moment over lead committees as well. Um, Isa from Article 19, I'd like to go back to you now for your closing statement. Thank you. Well, I echo what has been said. It's very, very good to have these kind of conversations. Uh, my uh, being here as a representative of end users and end users' rights, uh, specifically free expression, but also other rights, digital rights, my, um, my wish is uh, to see um, the DMA, the final text of the DMA and the DSA as uh, able to build the digital infrastructure that I think uh, users as well as businesses and society in general deserves for the near future. And I see interoperability as being a key element of it, a key element to empower users, a key element to foster innovation. And um, I do believe that uh, there are so many, so many use cases that could uh, take a lot of advantage by having you know, different nuances, different things. Uh, I, I tend, uh, I like the idea that we are at the beginning of it, although uh, time is uh, rushing in terms of, you know, also the discussion around those uh, legislative frameworks. And I hope that this conversation, it, it kind of gives a little bit of contribution to that. 
Thanks, Isa. Interoperability for empowering end users, says Isa Stasi from Article 19 there. Agustin Rayner from Buick, I'd like you to deliver your closing remarks, please. Thank you. Um, and thank you again for, for this extremely interesting discussion also to my co-panelists. Um, I think that we really have a chance to make things better, make things better for consumers and users, for startups and companies, but even for the gatekeepers. You know, we having, by having proper competition in this market, we can actually increase the, even their own incentives to continue innovating and, 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 and trying to bring you know, even better services for, um, uh, for consumers. So I truly believe that this can be uh, a win-win scenario for those that really want to compete on the merits of their, of their own services. Um, however, throughout the legislative process, we need to be all extremely vigilant. The devil is in the detail. And while we might, fo we might be focusing on Article 6, uh, F, or whatever we, we put this, um, the procedure is going to be crucial here. The enforcement is going to be crucial here. So we really need to pay a lot of attention on the procedures, how this is going to be enforced. I think, and you mentioned it, I think that having the commission enforcing this is great. We don't want to end up in a GDPR-like scenario. Uh, and, and, and on top of that, it makes sense. You know, the commission <clears throat> should have the resources, not those, <clears throat> sorry, not those forces enforcing here, <clears throat> but proper resources to enforce this. <clears throat> sorry. So, just to keep it short, <laughs> we need to we need to keep um, a close eye on, on on how the regulations going to be enforced in, in in practice by the commission. The rights, the eventual rights of third parties, to be able to submit complaints and and and, and raise concerns about the function of the regulation, um, in order to ensure that the effectiveness, you know, will be materialized in the short term, and we are not going to wait years like in many competition cases. Thank Let's you. hope so. Thank you very much. Agustin Rayner there. Platforms should compete on the merit of their services, Agustin Rayner says, and interoperability could be a segue into doing that. Well, that was a really rigorous and thorough examination of interoperability across the Digital Markets Act and Digital Services Act there this afternoon. A big thank you to our panelists for taking the time out of their busy schedules to join us. And thank you to all of you tuning in remotely for this session and for your contributions and questions. And of course, a thank you to Open Forum Europe for hosting today's panel. I think we have been left with plenty of food for thought with regards to the value of interoperability across the DSA and the DMA as part of the ongoing negotiations in the Parliament and Council. But that's all from us this afternoon. Thanks again for tuning in and we'll see you again next time. Thank you.